Hi everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week my first question comes from Cranes Not Skyhooks, who says, Hey Steve, I know you can run your channel however you like, but I gotta say I'm really worried that the quality of your channel is going to plummet now that you have a Patreon account. Before, the YouTube ads were just kind of there, and they didn't seem to affect the content of your channel at all. But now you have a don't forget to subscribe blurb, kind of annoying in my opinion, in your description box, along with a PayPal link and a Patreon link. I'm worried that you're going to further commercialize your channel like the many other skull-poundingly bad YouTube channels by bleeping out bad words, avoiding controversial or serious topics, frequently using jump cuts and cutaway gags, etc. I know you said that the content of your channel wouldn't change, but I've seen it happen many times to other channels. So can you reassure this longtime subscriber? Sorry I wrote you a novel. I never write long comments. Thanks. Have you noticed that my pronunciation seems to vary randomly between Patreon and Patreon? What's that about? Um, the proof in the pudding is in the eating, I would say. I can tell you that I would have no plans whatsoever to change the way I run the channel, to change the content, uh, to commercialize it, or to YouTube commercialize it, I guess, in any way. Uh, nor do I think that would even be that productive. I mean, I think I've built what audience I have on doing my thing and doing videos that are about subjects that I care about in a style that I'm comfortable with that I think is appropriate. Now, I really don't see any reason to change that. And I don't, I don't think I'm going to find a massive new audience by alienating the audience that I have. Um, and I'm concerned about that. And I, I, I sort of worried about that leading up to launching the, let's go with Patreon this time, the Patreon page. Uh, I'm sorry that you think that the, uh, don't forget to subscribe and uh, the links in the description box are uh, distracting or annoying. I, I really don't think they're that big of a deal. I think it's a relatively minor adjustment just to try and pick up a few extra subscriptions or to get a few extra dollars into that Patreon account. Um, I don't think that it's that major of a shift in, in uh, the channel. I mean, before, the videos all ended with just a link to my website, stevelikestocurse.com, which really I don't even do anything with other than post videos to, so it was kind of a redundant uh, link to have at the end of the, uh, the videos anyway. And look, um, it would be nice if I could do this for free, you know? I admire people who, uh, who do their YouTube channels completely at, on their own dime and they can afford to do that and they, they don't commercialize it, they, they don't monetize their videos, they, they don't have a Patreon account, they don't do any of that stuff because they can afford it or because they have a, another source of income or that's just what they have like a, a sense of, of artistic purity about their YouTube work. I think all of that is great. I don't think there's anything not to like and admire about that sort of thing. But I am just not in that position. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for people who just watch my stuff. But if there are some people who not only watch my stuff but think I could be worth a dollar a month for a Patreon donation, for a Patreon pledge, uh, I'm not going to turn my back to that. It's not going to affect the content. I don't think it's affected the content so far. My Patreon page has been public for uh, about two weeks now. I don't think I've altered my content in any way. I don't plan to. I mean, but, but as I say, you know, the t time will tell. The only thing I can do to reassure you is to say that I don't think it's going to change and to allow time to go by so you can see that it's not going to change in, in the ways that you're afraid it's going to change and be reassured by that. Now, here's another question about the Patreon page. I'm going back to Patreon. What is with that? Here's another question about the Patreon page. Uh, this is from the chemistry question. Let's talk about your Patreon page. My income varies wildly month to month, so is it okay if I instead donate to your PayPal when I can afford it? Also, why don't you fundraise through Steve Shives merchandise? Steve and Stuffy bobbleheads, t-shirts, autographed stuff, all that fun. I'd love it. Yeah, the thing about merchandising, though, is that you, to do it well and to do it to have it, enough stuff of high enough quality that people would actually buy enough of it that I would turn a profit, you need to have a bit more of an initial investment than I'm really willing to do at this point. Um, I, and I, I just, I mean, how do you merchandise my channel? It's all just me talking about shit. I mean, I know there's 
stuffy and the, the other stuffed animals that maybe you could merchandise at some level, but I'm just not really interested in that. And I don't know if there's, I don't know if my audience is big enough at this point to justify that. And I don't know if there's enough interest in the audience as it exists to justify that. But look, as far as donating uh, to Patreon, to PayPal, dude, you don't have to donate anything to me. I mean, if, especially if you can't afford it. If, if you're in a situation where you, you literally cannot afford, let's say, a dollar a month for uh, a Patreon pledge, don't worry about it. And please don't feel bad about it. That's not the point of the Patreon page. The point of, of the Patreon account is not to try and guilt trip people into paying me to do this. If you can afford it, and if you want to, I'm asking you to. I think that would be great. But if you can't afford it, or if you don't want to, for whatever reason, if, if you don't think I'm worth it, if you think that it's e-begging, I don't happen to think that it is, but if you think that, totally cool. Nothing's going to change. The videos are going to keep coming. You're still going to be able to watch them just as you always have been. Uh, but if you can and you want to, there it is. That's, that's the deal with the Patreon page. And if you can't afford it, please don't worry about it. Please don't feel bad. Don't feel like you owe me something or you have to make an excuse or an explanation. It's, it's not like that at all. Uh, if you can't afford it and you want to, go for it. If you can't, don't worry about it. Air 138. Okay, Steve, we have a recent circumstance that we find ironic amusing, and a dilemma of sorts. Trish and I have been hired to shoot and edit a Christian talk show for a TV station here. As you well know, we are atheists. Now, these people are incredibly nice. They also love the production quality we are giving to them, but we do wonder what they would do if they found out we are atheists. Now, we did have the dilemma of, do we help them spread their message? Really? Where should we draw the line? And then after many hours of discussion, we decided that we would be total hypocrites if we were to refuse our services to them based on the fact that they are religious. The bottom line is, we support freedom of speech, no matter how ridiculous the message is. If we were to deny them their freedom of speech, then that would give them the right to anyone else to deny us ours. So, who are we to not bake the cake? So we shot the first episode of their show today and had to bite our tongues during many parts of their dialogue, not because we were angry, but because we really wanted to try and talk reason to them. We saved all of those thoughts for the ride home. They really seem like decent people deep down, and we can tell that they truly believe what they are preaching and that their intent is good, even though their message is silly in our minds. Anyway, we took the gig and aren't going to mention that we are atheists unless they really push it. Now, my question is, how would you deal with this kind of situation? Would you take the gig in support of free speech? Or would you say, no way I'm going to help you perpetuate your batshit crazy ideas? P.S. Long-ass question dedicated to Ashley. We're hoping you read the entire thing out loud many times while she's in the room. You're welcome. Well, I read it out loud once while she was in the room, but she has her headphones on right now, so I don't think she even heard it. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you're you perfectly justified in taking the gig, not really in the name of free speech, because, uh, I mean, I think you would be justified in declining the gig because you disagreed with the message, and I don't think it would be a violation of that person's free speech. Uh, but just taking the gig in terms of making a living, I mean... There's, I, I, I like the comparison you draw with, you know, the, uh, the bakers refusing to bake the wedding cake for the gay couples because they, they don't believe in gay marriage. Um, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong if you choose to take a job making a Christian TV show and your profession is as, you know, video production people. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. You're a professional. You have a job. You're making a living. You're doing something you're good at and something you love to do. And, uh, you know, if you can't afford to be that choosy with your projects or if, if you don't feel like it's right to be that choosy with your project, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And uh, it's, it's completely up to you. <laughs> it's completely up to you what jobs you take, what shows you produce, uh, for what reasons. It's, it's, you know, there's no hypocrisy there. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And as I said before, I mean, you're making a living, and it's your job, and it's, you're a professional, and I'm sure you take a lot of pride in your work. And part of that pride is being able to take jobs 
you know, hired by people that, that may not necessarily reflect your beliefs and to still be able to give them a professional service and a professional product and to give them the, the, the same level of commitment and skill that you would give to anyone else or to a personal project of yours. I think it's actually sort of a mark of pride. David Landon, Steve, Disney and feminism is the topic. Do you give them any credit for at least improving their image in recent movies? Brave, Tangled, and Frozen portray much more confident, independent young women than the incredibly sexist movies of the past, like Cinderella, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty. On the other hand, they did try and sexualize the image of Merida, and Pixar probably had a lot to do with some of their better movies. Do you agree that they are at least moving in the right direction? And do you really not like any Disney stuff, not even Finding Nemo? I would agree that they seem to be moving in a good, positive direction as far as their portrayal of female characters. I, I mean, I, I only of the movies you mentioned, the, the the more recent ones, Brave, Tangled, and Frozen. I've only actually seen Brave. I haven't seen Tangled, and I haven't seen uh, Frozen, so I, I can't comment on those. But yeah, I thought Brave was relatively good as far as having a, a positive, proactive, her heroic female protagonist. I, I thought it was fine. And it's definitely a big improvement from the old classic Disney movies, like you were saying, like Snow White and Cinderella, where the girls are basically just there to be rescued by the the male heroes. Yeah, it's definitely a move in the right direction. And really, a lot of what Disney has done, both in terms of, of the content of their films and in terms of the way they run their amusement parks. I mean, politically, they've done a lot of things that are more progressive than you know, they might have been. And that, that it's, it, yeah, I give them credit for that. Um, there are some Disney movies that I don't think are all that bad. I actually, some of the Pixar stuff I like. I like, I've liked all three of the Toy Stories. Um, I haven't seen Finding Nemo. I haven't seen a lot of the Pixar movies. Uh, but the ones I have seen have been pretty good. Um, and, you know, and there are other, like, there are, there are Disney movies that I admire on a technical level, I admire the animation, I admire the visual artistry, while also thinking that the stories are just crap. <laughs> you know, like a lot of those old Disney animated, the, the Disney masterpieces, you know, like Snow White or Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella or uh, Pinocchio is a good one, uh, or Fantasia. I mean, the animation is just beautiful. On a technical level, they're just incredibly accomplished and I take nothing away from them on that score I just don't think they're very good stories I don't think they're very well written and uh, they don't have a, 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 in terms of the writing and the storytelling I don't find them very sophisticated but on a technical level they're terrific uh, so you know I don't hate everything Disney has ever done I just have a generally negative opinion of it Warp Rules Hi Steve, I asked in an earlier episode what you think makes good and bad screenwriting. Your answer was very insightful and something I had never thought of before. However, one thing bothered me. You said that you consider good writing when the viewer doesn't even notice the writing, and bad writing is when the writer puts his fingerprints on everything and tries to make his presence felt. This got me thinking about Quentin Tarantino. In most of his films, you can certainly tell that the writing, especially the dialogue, is very Tarantino-esque. You can really tell that this was written by Tarantino, and you certainly notice. Yet I think you agree that his movies are examples of great script writing. What gives? Well, there are a couple things that I would argue make Tarantino an exception to that rule. First, I might suggest that there's a difference between being uh, stylistically distinctive and stylistically intrusive. Uh, a writer can have a very distinctive recognizable style, as Tarantino definitely has, uh, without that being to the detriment of the film. Yeah, you, you can see Tarantino's fingerprints in the sense that he definitely has a very unique ear for dialogue, uh, a, a very unique rhythm to his writing of characters and their conversations, uh, and uh, a love for deconstructing tropes and deconstructing plot devices and shooting and editing, presenting his, his film in non-linear stories and uh, just doing all sorts of, of what used to be considered unconventional things that now, thanks to the success of Tarantino, have become actually more conventional ways of, of telling a story. But yeah, so he does all that. Uh, and I think one of the reasons he gets away with it is that he's just so damn good at it. You know, there's, uh, my, my screenwriting teacher used to tell us that there are certain rules to screenwriting, there are certain formulas that are followed, and it's perfectly acceptable to deviate from the formulas 
and to break the rules, but you better have a damn good reason for doing it, and you had better be confident that you're good enough to pull it off. Because the reason why those structures exist, and why they have sort of evolved into what they are, is because most writers rely on them, and necessarily rely on them, in order to, to build their story. And uh, if you are a true talent, a truly prodigious talent, as Tarantino is, as a writer and as a director, uh, you can get away with breaking those rules and with being a little bit more, or sometimes a lot more, excessive in uh, putting your personal stamp on things. Because look, you, you want movies to have some sense of, 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 a, of a personal style of the director or of the writer. You don't want all the movies to feel the same. You want you know, to be able to tell, oh, this is a Coen Brothers movie, oh, this is a Tarantino movie, this is a Scorsese movie, this is a, a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, this is a Wes Anderson movie, etc. You want there to be some stylistic fingerprints on there in some way because it makes it feel distinctive, it makes it feel personal, it makes it feel recognizably the work of that artist. Uh, but there's, yeah, but there is a line between style and being intrusive and trampling over the story you're trying to tell and getting in your story's way. And it's that kind of thing I was saying is the mark of bad screenwriting. Um, but yeah, Tarantino gets away with it, as do those other filmmakers I mentioned, uh, because he's just an incredible, incredible talent. And I would also say that Tarantino isn't perfect. I mean, there are times when I do find Tarantino's films even if it's just particular scenes to be a little overwritten or, you know, he's uh, doing the Tarantino thing a little too emphatically or too energetically. So there are times when he, I think, in my opinion, he, he crosses that line. Uh, but for the most part, he pulls it off because he's Tarantino. Carace123, thanks so much for pointing me to Wildwood Claire 1, Steve. Not only did she enliven an otherwise boring weekend, I feel I have learned a fair bit about geology, too. You've won her at least one new subscriber. Could I address a film question to you? Having enjoyed and largely agreed with your take on Citizen Kane recently, and in the knowledge that you recommended one of my favorite, forgive British spelling, film noirs out of the past, do you have any opinion, positive or otherwise, of Night of the Hunter? which I generally name as my favorite if asked to do so. Although, to be honest, having only one favorite is ludicrous. Would be interested in your comments. Many thanks. I love Night of the Hunter. Night of the Hunter is a brilliant, brilliant film. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's uh, starring Robert Mitchum, one of Robert Mitchum's greatest performances, if not his greatest performance, and that is saying something. Uh, directed by Charles Lawton, who was best known as an actor, actually, particularly in the silent era. Uh, he actually played the Hunchback of Notre Dame in uh, a, a very well-acclaimed silent version of, of that story. Uh, it's just an amazing movie. It's a great film noir. It's a great, it's almost a horror movie. Mitchum plays this uh, traveling preacher. And one of the iconic images in the film that many, many people are aware of, even if they don't know the film, is he has the, the words love and hate tattooed on the, the fingers of his hands. When he makes a fist and goes like that, it says love and hate. And... Uh, you know, and he he uses that in his preaching. He tells the story of Cain and Abel, and you know, love and hate, and how they're constantly at war in both of us. And uh, it's it's uh, just you know an amazing movie, an amazing movie. And I have a hugely positive opinion of it. Um, a great black and white photography, great use of music, especially the song leaning that uh, Mitchum's character sings to himself, and it, it, it's, it's supposed to be like a religious song, like it's like a church hymn. It's supposed to be calming and uplifting, and you know, it's about leaning on the everlasting arms of God, but Mitchum sings it in this low, creepy drone that it becomes this, this ominous harbinger of danger and death, and it's just, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary film. It's an extraordinary film. It's one of my very favorites. And if you have, if anybody watching this hasn't seen it, you should check out *Night of the Hunter*. Uh, it's awesome. Mitchum's performance strikes with all the power and immediacy of a thunderbolt. Of a thunderbolt. Of a lightning bolt. 
peculiar, very particular. But anyway, you know what that means. It's time for the lightning round. Rapid fire questions, glib and adequate answers. Dear Wunderbar Bar, I love it that UK has banned teaching creationism as a science in public schools. When do you think US will follow suit? I think probably never, but hope springs eternal. Yeah, hope springs eternal for me too, but you're right, probably never. Although it should be banned right now. You don't teach the 12 labors of Hercules in history class. You shouldn't teach creationism in science class. It is not science. It is the opposite of science. Um, Lewis Ng 114, how often do you run into your subscribers? Almost never. For one thing, even though I'm amazingly fortunate to have over 40,000 subscribers now, uh, in terms of the population of this country, it's really not that many. It's not that huge of an audience. Um, and most of them are not from around here. So I don't I, I, I don't think I've ever run into it. I've, wanted, I've run into a subscriber like once, uh, just being out and about. So it doesn't happen hardly at all. Kamikaze Sasquatch. Hey Steve, you seem to be an authority on all things nerd, but I've never heard you talk about video games. Are you not a gamer? Either way, how do you feel about Roger Ebert's infamous statement that video games can never be art? I'm not really a gamer. The last console I owned was a PlayStation 2 that I gave away to a friend like 10 years ago, so I'm not really that much of a gamer. Uh, I'm not that interested in it. But I disagree with Ebert. Ebert famously said that he didn't think video games could be art. I think they can be. I see no reason why they can't be. Just they're just a, it will be a, they're a very very different form of art than a film. A film is more of you know you're watching something. You're letting an artist tell you a story, and in a video game, you're taking a much more active role in the story. But I see no reason why that can't be art. Did ya? Hi, Steve Shives. I know you love Zack Snyder. What did you think of Watchmen? Prepares for crying. I actually thought Watchmen was great. Uh, Watchmen is a very deeply flawed movie. There's a lot wrong with Watchmen. But there's also a lot right with Watchmen. And the things that Watchmen gets right, I feel it gets so incredibly right that the good outweighs the bad. That's my feeling on Watchmen. I have a very positive opinion of Watchmen, despite many problems that it has. Uh, Burn Shot 28. Is free will an illusion? I don't know. Because if it is an illusion, it's such a convincing one that there's no way for me to tell. So I'm just going to go ahead and assume that it's not, because I can't tell either way. Uh, DZOSU071. What are, in your opinion, the top five greatest black and white films? Okay, uh, I'll go Sherlock Jr., City Lights by Charlie Chaplin, uh, Ikiru by Akira Kurosawa, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front by Lewis Milestone, and another Kurosawa film, we'll just throw in Seven Samurai. Those are five fucking amazing black and white movies. Um, actually, when I, when, when I usually write down like my top five or top ten movies, I think the only color film in the top five is usually 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's, there's a lot of black and white shit. Um, Nicholas James, hey Steve, lightning round question. What phone do you use? Are you an old man with his candy bar phone? A hipster with your ironic flip phone? Are you a narcissist? who has to get the latest and greatest whenever your contract runs out. Other, I will show you my phone. Just a moment. <clears throat> this is my phone here. This is my actual phone that I use. Uh, it's not ironic. It's poor. <laughs> it's, it's, it's due to not being able to afford or not wanting to spend the money to upgrade to like a smartphone. Uh, so that this is my actual phone that I use. Um, there was a joke in a Stephen Stuffy video about me upgrading to a new phone. It was basically just another flip phone. Uh, that's f relatively true to life. <laughs> um, Blake Ladwig. Question, Steve. If I remember correctly, you're a teacher, and I just got a list of all the classes I have to take to get my secondary education degree. First, can you explain why I have to take two semesters of acting? Second, since you have become a teacher, if you have any useful or funny advice, please let it loose. Now, uh, I, wa I, I included this question because I want to make it clear in case anybody has somehow gotten the erroneous impression that I am a teacher, that I am not a teacher. I went, when I started college, I was pursuing an education degree, but I left the education program relatively early on, and my degree is not in education, and I am not 
a teacher. So let me make that perfectly clear because I would hate to give people the wrong impression. And I would hate to sully the reputation of teachers everywhere by including myself among their ranks. So, uh, but as for why, sh why, why you would need to take acting, I don't know. I mean, I think it might help if you're going to stand up in front of <laughs> a group of high schoolers or middle schoolers or whatever. So you said secondary education, whatever grade you would be teaching uh, and have to command the room you know, and have to project authority and get them to listen to you and respect you. I think acting is actually a pretty damn good idea. I don't know why they didn't require acting in the uh, education program that I abandoned. Um, Randy Owens, hey Steve, when you're doing the driving portions of your off Monday rambles, is your wife holding the camera or do you have some kind of mount for it attached somewhere? If it's a mount, could we see a pic of it? Just curious if it's much like any of the possibilities that have crossed my mind. Um, I won't show you a pic of it now, but uh, on the next off Monday ramble episode, I'll include like a shot of the rig. It is a rig. Uh, Ashley is not there holding the camera. Um, it's basically my tripod in the passenger seat and it's strapped and buckled in so that it doesn't move. It's rendered immobilized by a combination of the seat belt and some bungee cords and uh, that's basically it. <laughs> it's just a rigged up tripod in the passenger seat. RHM Bach, you've mentioned repeatedly that Yingling is your favorite beer at the moment, but it's not a beer I've ever seen. What is it like? Is it similar to any of the other beers you've had, foreign or domestic? I am not really an expert on beer. I'm not a beer connoisseur, but uh, Yingling is good. It's actually, it's a regional beer. I think it's only available in the eastern U.S., so maybe that's why you've never seen it. You're not familiar with it. Um, I like it because it's not, it's sort of in between. It's not too light, so it tastes and looks like piss, but it's not really heavy and highly alcoholic like, you know, maybe a, a craft beer would be. Uh, so it's a good balance, uh, you know, because I, I don't want beer to be light and watery and pissy, but at the same time, I'm too much of a wuss and a lightweight to be able to pound back uh, too many craft beers. So it's good. It's a, it's a good compromise for me, and I like it. It's, it's relatively palatable for beer, I find. Well, hey, that is it for the lightning round. But before I get out of here, uh, I want to do a shout out as always. And the shout out this week goes to a YouTube channel that is also connected with a website. And the name of both <laughs> is Carnades.org. Carnades.org, uh, the YouTube channel and the website, is dedicated to philosophy. And as you may know, may have noticed if you've watched my An Atheist Read series, I talk about philosophy in those a fair bit, but I am not all that well versed in philosophy. I'm not formally trained as a philosopher. Oh, there's that beer. Uh, I've, I've not taken like philosophy courses very extensively. I have not very deeply read as far as philosophy goes. So a website and a, and a channel like Carnades Dot org is actually a great resource for someone like me and perhaps for someone like you who is also interested in philosophy, interested in thinking about things and talking about things and pursuing routes of, of knowledge and thought that you may not actually be all that well equipped yourself to navigate. Uh, Carnades.org is, is a terrific resource. There are videos there specifically if you're interested in the great debate thing and atheism versus theism. Uh, there's a series of videos that uh, he has been putting up the last few months uh, about presuppositionalism, about summarizing what presuppositionalism is, what the underlying claims are, and also uh, what various philosophers throughout history have said in response to the ideas uh, put forward by presuppositionalism. So it's, it's a really interesting series. It's a great channel. It's a great website, and I highly recommend that you subscribe to the channel. Uh, it's still a growing channel. It's still a young, relatively small channel. Uh, he just reached, uh, just crossed a thousand subscribers not too long ago, just a few months ago. So get in on the ground floor of uh, Carnades.org. It's a terrific channel, well worth your attention, and a, uh, a hearty shout out from me to Carnades.org. So check it out. Subscribe if it's, if it's your type of thing. Um, that is it. For this week, I will be back again next week, as I wipe my nose, to do this all over again, provided, of course, that you guys ask me some questions, because for this to happen, you have to ask. So leave a comment on this video. Ask me your question for next time. Ask me anything about anything. 
No topic is too serious, no topic is too silly. I will try to answer as many of them as I possibly can. And until next time, <laughs> take care everybody, and I'll see you soon.